Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great day. So today I'd like to take the time to show you how to construct a Lewis dot structure for a molecular compound or polyatomic ion given its chemical formula. So there's a step-by-step -step, list of instructions that I'm going to walk you through, um, but before we get into any examples, um, I want to make sure that you understand that at this point in your chemistry education, you should know about chemical bonds, you should know about covalent chemical bonds, you should know about valence electrons, uh, you should also know things like energy levels, sublevels, orbitals, electron configurations. You should know all of these things because I will be talking about them in this video. So if you don't know them, please um, study these things um, either by my content or elsewhere. Um, bring yourself up to speed because I don't want you to get frustrated. So anyway, um, at this point, uh, we need to understand, uh, <clears throat> before we get into the step-by-step -step instructions on how to draw Lewis structures, let's just re-familiarize ourselves with what Lewis structures actually are intended to show us. Uh, Lewis dot structures are intended to show us which atoms are covalently bonded to which. It's also intended to show us uh, what kind of bonds we have, single, double, or triple covalent bonds, which have two, four, and six valence electrons in them, respectively. And we also get to look at which uh, electrons are used for bonding, in other words, which electrons are in the form of bonding pairs of electrons. And it also shows us which types of electrons are localized on individual atoms, and those are called lone pair electrons. They belong to just one atom, and they're not participating in chemical bonding. So that's what Lewis dot structures tell us. They don't tell us a lot. They don't tell us about how the molecule is shaped or anything like that. We're going to get into that um, in more detail um, in a later video. But now that we know, oh, and the other really important thing to understand is how to uh, identify how many valence electrons of an atom of a given element there are um, based on its position in the periodic table. And it's actually very easy. All you do is just number the groups, the main group groups from one, the alkali metals, all the way to eight, the noble gases. And the number of valence electrons that an atom of an element has is simply going to be the group number in which that element belongs. So for instance, oxygen being in group 6, going to have 6 valence electrons, nitrogen being in group 5, going to have 5 valence electrons, and so on and so forth. The only exception is helium, which even though it's in group 8, it has 2 electrons, but for any compounds, you're not really going to have to worry about helium. Um, so let's go ahead and start with an example. We'll start with an easy one, then we'll kind of, you know, go into a, a couple of it are a little bit harder. I really want to just introduce the concept here. Um, in a future video, I might do some more complicated examples. Um, probably definitely will actually do some more complicated examples to invoke further concepts later. Uh, but I, I just want to make sure you get the technique down and the um, you know step-by-step -step instructions down and then we can move on to the harder examples either later on in this video or in a future video. So stay tuned even after this video if you will please. So the first example that we're going to start with is water H2O. We have its chemical formula, two hydrogens, one oxygen, and we want to get its Lewis dot structure. So the first step is to count the total number of valence electrons for all of the atoms in the molecule. And in order to do this, um, again, we use that little trick where the number of valence electrons is equal to the group number uh, to figure this out. So hydrogen, we have one valence electron, and there are two of them for a total of two valence electrons coming from hydrogen. And then in the case of oxygen, we have six valence electrons for each oxygen. There's only one oxygen, and so that tacks on another six valence electrons, and so it looks like we have a total of eight valence electrons in this and my personal preference is to um, specify it in terms of electron pairs rather than individual electrons because it keeps the numbers low um, so if we divide eight valence electrons by uh, by two then we'll get four electron pairs also if you're dealing with a polyatomic ion in other words if you see a plus or a minus sign or a two plus or a two minus or anything like that you're going to add or remove electrons um, to accommodate that charge. So for instance, if you have a charge of plus one on your ion, then you're gonna take one electron away from the total valence electron count. If you have a charge of minus two, since electrons are negatively charged, if you have a charge of minus two or two minus, you're gonna add two electrons to the total valence electron count after you've already summed up the valence electrons for all of the atoms uh, in the molecule or in the polyatomic ion. But in this case, there's no charge, so we don't have to worry about that. So we have eight valence electrons, which is four electron pairs. The next step, step two, is to arrange the atoms correctly. Now, there's a couple of guidelines to keep in mind when you're arranging the atoms correctly. Number one, um, and this should be obvious to you by now, but in case it's not, hydrogen can never be a central atom. So let's define central atom. Central atom is just anything with two or more 
covalent bonds around it. Hydrogen can never have two or more covalent bonds around it. Why? Well, because hydrogen only has enough space to accommodate two electrons. That's it. It's in the very first period of the periodic table in which there's only this first principal energy level, in which there's only the 1s sublevel, in which there's only a single 1s orbital, in which there's only two electrons at the most. So hydrogen can only have two electrons at the most. We call that a duet. Uh, if you read, if, if you watched my octet rule video, uh, hydrogen likes to achieve a duet, which is the same electron configuration as helium. So it will never form more than one covalent bond. It will always, anytime it's bonded to anything, it will only be bonded to one atom. So there's only one possible arrangement of the atoms that works in this case, uh, which is an oxygen with a hydrogen atom on either side. Now, what if we had more than one non-hydrogen atom in here? How would we choose which one is the central atom? Well, the central atom is going to be the atom with the highest degree of metallic character. So it's going to be the most metal-like element that's going to go in the center. How do you know which element is the most metal-like? Well, if you have your periodic table handy, um, it's going to be the elements that are the lowest and leftmost in the periodic table. So if two elements are in the same group, vertical column, then the one at the bottom is going to be the central atom. If two elements are in the same period or horizontal row, then the element on the left is going to be the central atom. So that's how you figure that out. But in the case of water, there's only one possible central, central atom, the oxygen atom. So we have four electron pairs. We have an arrangement. Uh, step number three is to assign electron pairs such that there are single bonds between every two atoms in the structure. Single covalent bonds between every two atoms. So that means we're going to put a pair of electrons to make a single bond between the oxygen and one of the hydrogens, and we're also going to assign another pair of electrons um, to form that other single covalent bond between the oxygen and the other hydrogen atom. And I like to kind of keep a running count of how many electrons I have left to assign. We started out with uh, four electron pairs. We just used up two, and so now we have two electron pairs remaining to assign to this water molecule. So the next step after you've uh, made your single bonds is to assign pairs of electrons on atoms in the form of lone pairs. Remember, lone pairs are the ones that don't participate in chemical bonding. They are localized on individual atoms in the compound, right, in the molecule. So you're going to assign lone pairs to atoms, giving octets to as many atoms as possible. And again, an octet, that's eight electrons around an atom. It's a you know, basically like a noble gas. It's a super low energy, stable configuration that all the atoms want to achieve, basically. So we're, we're going to assign lone pairs, and in this case, the only place that our lone pairs can go, and we, again, we have two more left to assign, the only place where our lone pairs can go is on the oxygen atom, for reasons that we've already talked about. The hydrogens don't have any more orbitals to accommodate any electrons. And so sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes you're going to have Lewis dot structures in which there's, you know, more than one type of element, more, you know, atoms of, of more than one type of element, and you're going to try to, you know, scratch your head and think, okay, well, which one gets the lone pairs first? And the answer is it's going to be the element that has the highest electron affinity that gets the lone pair electrons first. And then you're going to move in decreasing electron affinity order. Uh, how do you know which one has the higher electron affinity? Well, that's going to be the ones that are... Uh, highest and rightmost in the periodic table. So if two elements are in the same group, the one that's higher up is going to be uh, the one that gets the lone pairs first. Um, if two elements are in the same horizontal uh, period of the periodic table, then it's going to be the one on the right that's going to get the lone pairs first. But like I said, in this case with water, we don't have to worry about that. The only place where they can go is on the oxygen atom. And at this point, we've used up our two remaining electron pairs, and so we have no more electrons to put around this thing. Um, the next step after we've used up all of our electrons is to check to make sure we have octets in the case of every non-hydrogen atom and duets, which is pretty easy, in the case of any hydrogen atoms. And if you look at the hydrogens, of course, they have a duet, they're good to go. And if you cover up those two hydrogens and you know expose the oxygen and all its valence electrons, then you will see an octet, you will see eight valence electrons around it, and so we're done. This is a correct Lewis dot structure for water. They won't always be this easy, um, but the process and technique will pretty much be the same. 
So let's move on to a slightly more complicated example. We have carbon dioxide, CO2. The first step, of course, is to count the total number of valence electrons. For carbon, there's one carbon atom with four valence electrons, and so we have four from carbon. We have two oxygen atoms, each with six valence electrons, for a total of 12 valence electrons coming from oxygen. So 12 plus 4, it looks like we've got 16 valence electrons. Divide that by 2, and you get eight valence electron pairs. The next step is to come up with the proper arrangement of these atoms. In the case of CO2, it's going to be the carbon in the middle with an, an oxygen on either side. Carbon, if you look at your periodic table, lies to the left of oxygen. It has the higher metallic character, and so it's going to be our central atom. You would not have an oxygen bonded to another oxygen and a carbon. Instead, the carbon will always be in the center. It's the most stable configuration that way. So we've got our arrangement. Uh, now what we do is we um, make those single covalent bonds between every two atoms. So that's going to use up two electron pairs. So we had um, how many? We had eight electron pairs, and so we just used up two. So we have six electron pairs remaining after we introduce those single covalent bonds. And now uh, we're going to assign lone pairs uh, to the, you know, the highest electron affinity atoms first, right, which in this case between oxygen and carbon is oxygen. And so we want to use up as many lone pairs as we have to give those oxygens octets. And then if there are any left, then we can put them on the carbon. But if you do it yourself, we have six uh, lone pairs remaining. It's going to take all six of those lone pairs just to give octets to those two peripheral oxygen atoms. So we're done with that step. The next step is to check to see if we have octets, right? And it looks to me like I'm imagining it, this in my head right now because I've done this about, you know, a few hundred times for CO2. But I'm imagining it in my head right now. But um, it looks to me like the oxygens have octets, but the carbon atom doesn't. All carbon has around it are those two single covalent bonds, those four electrons, those two electron pairs. And so, so carbon doesn't have an octet, and so this isn't going to work. We have to invoke another step that we didn't have to invoke for water, um, but now we, we, we do in the case of CO2. And this step involves moving electron pairs um, from peripheral atoms. In other words, we're going to take some lone pair electrons from peripheral atoms, and we're going to move them in to the bonding region between the peripheral atom and the central atom um, in order to form multiple covalent bonds. So in some cases it's double covalent bonds, in other cases we're going to form triple covalent bonds in order to give the central atom an octet. So in this case, if we take one lone pair from one of the oxygens and move it in between the oxygen and the carbon, and we do the same thing on the other side, if we take one lone pair from that oxygen and move it to form a new um, Co to, to basically form uh, a, a double covalent bond between the carbon and the oxygen, then it looks like we're going to have two double covalent bonds. So this uh, carbon atom is doubly bonded to these two oxygens, and if you count the electrons around the carbon, those two double covalent bonds in total, that's four electron pairs, uh, which is eight electrons. So the, the carbon atom in forming those two double covalent bonds has an octet, so it's stable. Um, all three atoms have an octet. They're all stable. And so this is how carbon dioxide exists in nature. Um, hopefully, now that, you know, if you didn't already know before, hopefully you'll start thinking of CO2 and, you know, everything around you <laughs> more generally um, in a different way. You know, the, the carbon dioxide that's floating around, um, you know, in car exhausts or, you know, to a very, very small degree in the air, you know, all that CO2 um, is a collection of these tiny little molecules with, um, each containing a carbon atom doubly bonded to two oxygens. And so that's CO2. Um, so that's, I think, you know what, I, I think I'll stop with the examples there. Um, I certainly have a, a more than a lot more to say about this because, uh, you know, there's some, there's some advanced concepts such as uh, resonance and formal charge and stuff like that. But I think this is a good um, place to stop because I think it gives you sort of the methodology and the technique that, you know, the way... There's a way to go about it. You know, sometimes you can skip some steps, other times you can't. But this is the way to go about it. And um, and we're, another thing that we're going to do in a future video is we're going to look at some patterns that exist. Because as you practice these things more and more, you're going to start to see patterns among certain atoms, among certain elements. You're going to see, like, you know, the number of bonds 
uh, and the number of lone pairs that can exist around atoms, uh, you know, like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, like you're going to see, you know, usually how many lone pairs does an oxygen have versus how many bonding pairs does an oxygen have around it. Um, and, and we're going to, so we're going to, yeah, we're going to just talk about those more, uh, more important concepts later. Not more important. I don't know what I'm saying, but <laughs> more advanced concepts. There we go. More advanced concepts later. But at this point, it seems like I'm rambling and I want to end on a high note. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Um, and if you, if you'd like to donate to me, um, I would love to receive your donations. Um, if the content has been valuable to you. Um, I would really appreciate it. Um, so thank you very much in advance for anybody who's watching this, and especially thank you for any of those who are who either have donated or are considering donating to me. I really appreciate even just the thought of it. So, all right, that's it. Um, I'll see you in the next video. All right.